So last week we converted and painted all nine trade allegiance for the Horus Heresy out of the brand new Mark III kit that Games Workshop sent us. And in that video, you requested that we do the Loyalists. So we decided to ignore you. The rest of the video is dead. No, that's a lie. We're gonna do the Loyalists, so get excited. Go traders. Yeah, I agree, boo. Some division amongst the ranks here. <laughs> so we're each picking three different factions to paint up and convert. So let's see what the Mark III kit can do with the Loyalist Legion. It's, it's tabletop top time. time. So I'm up first today and I am doing the Dark Angels, the first Legion and probably my favorite of all the Loyalist Legions. I've been a fan of these since the Horus Heresy novels depict them really well and super interestingly, showing us a little bit of Caliber Knight life before these people become Space Marines. They're very knightly, secretive and also have a fondness for advanced or archaic technology. And we had noticed in the previous video, one of my thoughts on this armor didn't make it to the final cut, which I think bears sense. While I do overall quite like this Mark III Iron Armor upgrade, especially for the scale and level of detail, the one thing that makes me sad about it is the design changes on the backs of the legs. I think this is a lot more bland and boring than the very iconic Mark III used to be. I can only hope this is so that when they do Mark II in plastic, the two armor patterns are distinguished by these differences, and Mark II has those heavy ridged plates on the back of the legs. So Mark III is a natural fit for the very knightly, heavy studded plates of armor and the obvious rivets all over it just give it a more medieval feel. Also the face plate or grill of the helmet is quite reminiscent of a medieval great helm. To really make my dark angel feel like a dark angel, I cut the spike off the top of the helmet and rounded it off, making it look even more reminiscent of a knight's helmet. And then I gave him a piece of dark angel specific war gear. This is the plasma repeater. Now personally, I don't like fielding weapons that have a different name and different rules, but look the same as another piece. So I always kit bash. In this instance, what I've done is I've added on a flame canister to the back of the plasma gun and used two of the van braces from the Mark III kit to create a sort of armored cowl that I think looks a bit odd here, but when painted up should look super dark angels. The idea here is this is like a supercharged rapid fire short range plasma gun. So it needs some extra heat shields and also sort of like a plasma injector on the back of it. These simple conversions, I can get ready to paint. So I finished converting my little dark angel, but as so often happens, we're out of chaos black spray. But thankfully airbrush brushes are often the solution. And we actually got sent a couple of airbrushes by a company called Neo Echo. And uh, we're gonna try them out, see if they're any good. We don't know. So we'll put some links down in the description and if you like them, you can go check them out. If not, whatever, they didn't sponsor us. <laughs> now the Dark Angels paint scheme is deceptively simple, but also deceptively difficult. And the problem with this is three of the Loyalist chapters are essentially black with silver trim. So to make them look distinct, you have to play some tricks. So I sprayed my model black and then used two dry brushing steps to just bring up a little bit of a highlight across all the armor and then it was time to paint the trim. I went with a slightly brown tinged silver and then washed it all with seraphim sepia before highlighting it back again. Now in all the art, that is definitely where you can differentiate the Dark Angels from the Raven Guard and the Iron Hands. It's in that sepia tinted metal. Most of the mechanical elements and the trim are this same metal color, so there aren't many places to differentiate there either. So with these steps done, the model does look fairly boring. So the solution to this is the very exciting checker patterns and heraldry that the Dark Angels have. Unfortunately, this can be quite difficult for people new to painting or without brush control. So thankfully there are transfers out there you can find that will help you out. I've got a bit of experience painting though, so I quickly did some checkered patterns in red and cream, just trying my best to make all the squares the same size. This immediately uplifts the model and you can see that it feels more dark angel-y straight away. Now I wanna take my time with the dark angel to talk about transfers. Really don't be afraid of them. Transfers are fantastic. As long as you use products such as Microset or Microsol, and I use Mr. Mark Softer and Mr. Mark Setup. Basically, one allows the transfer to adhere properly and the other one dissolves the sheet that it's on, meaning it doesn't look shiny once it's finished on the model. Horus Heresy Legions have amazing transfer sheets that I thoroughly recommend, but I don't have the Dark Angels one, so I decided to use a 40K one. This symbol is a lot more boring in 40K than the gorgeous wing decal that we have for Horus Heresy, but let's not worry too much about that. Dark Angels often display personal heraldry from Caliban, so I decided to use a Griffin from a Titanicus Knight transfer sheet and the number six to denote this character's personal heraldry and his squad number. These heraldry and patterns mean a lot to the Dark Angels, so I also put a green strip on the back of his right leg. This green represents the forest of his home on Caliban, 
Caliban and it being on the back of his right leg to me represents the fact that Caliban is always at his back. He fights forward for his homeworld and carries the representation of that with him into battle. For the plasma repeater that I kit bashed, I went for the iconic Dark Angels red on the outside of it and then painted a little simple plasma glow, gradiating from bright white to darker blues and then doing a little blue dry brush for the glow. To keep on theme for the basing and inject a little bit more color into the model, I went for a heavily tufted and plant covered base reminiscent of his homeworld of Caliban. I think this vibrant life contrasts really nicely with the dark scheme of the Marine and altogether that makes him finished. Let's move on to the next Legion. Okay, my first Legion is going to be the 5th Legion, the White Scars, known for their lightning strikes and rapid mobility, and also running ahead of their supply lines, much to the dismay of their human logisticians. But that's beside the point, they are super cool and have a real emphasis on getting around fast. So, naturally, the big, clunky Mark III heavy armour doesn't really immediately sound like it would be a good fit to the White Scars. So I'm gonna think about a narrative here and I'm thinking that this could be one of the pilots or riders of one of the jet bikes, one of their outriders that get into combat, often getting either knocked off or literally just jumping off their bike when it's time to close ranks and get in with some good fisticuffs. So that is gonna be the focus of my Marine. In the context of having jumped off his bike, he's going to be the spoiler with one of the really fine, beautiful White Scars glaives that they're known for. As that extra bit of reach would really help him atop his bike. So let's get into it. So to create this huge glaive, I'm going to go through all of bits. And luckily I found a Stormcast Eternal with a spear haft that I can use for this purpose. As conveniently, the hands are about the exact same size and make. This is a great conversion technique and I would encourage anyone to give that a go. Once I shave all the little spikes and things down and make it look a bit less brutal, I'm going to acquire an old power axe, take the power unit from that, cutting everything else off and then gluing that onto the end of the haft. Now, all I need is a blade. And the White Scars are known for exquisite beautiful blades. And I personally just happen to have a spare Howling Banshee arm lying around. As you do, this is a bit more niche, I'll admit, but it's perfect, so I couldn't not use it. So I'll cut that down to size, trim it up, and attach it to the side of the power unit. And just like that, I have an incredibly unique weapon just for my white scar. Final touches will include an arm with a bolt pistol. This is an old firstborn arm with a bolt pistol. As Games Workshop, please supply bolt pistols for heresy in not just the upgrade spoof the despoilers. Like, we, we just need more bolt pistols. And then for a final garnish, the top knot from one of the old cow space marine heads. I'll just clip that right off and apply it exactly where the spike was on the Mark III armor. Just like how I painted the World Eater in the Traitor video, I'm going to take the exact same approach with priming with my white scars. Starting with the grey and then doing a heavy zenithal with white. Then for a more uniform appearance, I'm going to take a sepia colour and heavily dilute it down, washing over the entirety of the white model. Then when I finish the panel, I'll use my thumb to wipe away all the paint on the raised area. This will immediately bring back the white as a highlight and create cool streak marks. Then I'll mix a couple of contrast paints together to create a really nice strong red. This will create a really nice red trim instead of a metal colour that a lot of the other legions use. All the metal areas will get a nice heavy overbrush. Then for the half of the weapon, I'm going to go for a really nice regal pink because I don't want to have too much red on the model. I'm a madman and I like to paint all my legion decals. So after I paint the lightning bolt of the white scars, I'll go through and start working on the base. Finishing off with a nice bit of pigment to really bind everything all together. So for my first Horus Heresy Loyalist paint job, I'm doing the 6th Legion, the Space Wolves. Known as the executioners of the Horus Heresy, they were a fearsome foe to anyone who tried to stand up against them. Their distinct look takes inspiration from Nordic and Viking culture, making them very distinct in battle, favoring close combat assaults and brutal tactics to help them beat their foes. It should be mentioned that Space Wolves actually despised psychers and favored rune priests instead, which are basically psychers. Hypocrites! Badness did nothing wrong! So for all of the converting that we've done today for this project, we had the Horus Heresy Loyalist book. So I was able to reference this and get some ideas of what I wanted to include in my conversion. When it came to the Space Wolves, I didn't need to do too much in order to convert them into one, but there were a couple of things I wanted to add. I noticed that Space Wolves have a lot of runic styling to them. I also think that the Mark III armor works really well for the Space Wolves because it was stronger. So that kind of makes them more tanky and more ferocious. So for my Space Wolves guy, I wanted to add an ax and a shield. So for my conversion, I found this Puppet's War shield that I thought could look really cool. I thought this looked really themey and could be a really cool inclusion. I also opted to give him a bear head, but not a 
bear head, just a head that you could see his face. I thought this worked better with the army as well. I also found this pelt lying around too, and I thought this worked really well. Originally, I wanted it on the shoulder, but instead I opted it for a little tabard in between his legs. With my conversion all done, I've made up my gray seer and he is ready to paint. This seems to be a theme around the loyalist army, so luckily enough, there was one for the space wolves. I went ahead and slapped this contrast paint all over my guy and waited for it to dry. Once that was all dry, I went ahead and gave it a very light dry brush just to make the colors more even. Again, I went ahead and added more contrast paints into the different areas that I felt like needed to be colored. This included his axe and the fur tabard in between his legs. Once I was happy with how this was looking, I worked on the metal, trying to incorporate more of the greeny, dirty gold that shows in the Horus Heresy books. Once his armor was all nicely painted, it was time to move on to the base. I actually opted to base all of my loyalists in more of a plant-based environment. So for the space wolves, I had to go with snow. I put down just a base layer of brown and then slopped the snow on top with a couple of tufts. To complete the look, I added a little bit of snow just on top where it'd be falling on him while he's standing waiting for his next victim. And with that, my gray layer is all finished. Time for the Seventh Legion, the Imperial Fists. There's only two things you need to know about the Imperial Fists. They love bolters and they like building sandcastles for the Emperor. Really big sandcastles. The exact opposite of the Iron Warriors who love breaking things, the Imperial Fists love to build fortifications. So I'm going to combine both archetypes here and create a tactical marine standing on the broken masonry of a fallen fortification. Now from this it's a no-brainer that Mark III perfectly suits Imperial Fists and it saw huge use among the Legion for the entirety of that era. Creating this guy will be pretty straightforward so the area I'm going to lavish all the detail and thought into is the Basing. The body I'm using here has a really wide stance, so I think it'd be really cool to have him have one foot propped up on some broken battlement as he sprays fire down on the enemy below. So to do this, I'm going to use the all-time classic cork board to get the feeling that he's actually mounted upon this correctly. A great trick is to glue the masonry onto their feet to start with. Then you can finagle with the angles and bulk. Then he's the most grounded he could possibly be. And you can alter the angle further by how you actually glue it onto the base itself, adding extra material to get exactly the angle you want. For a bit of extra detail, I decided to use the sergeant head with the attachment for the plume, which looks really cool and I think suits the Imperial Fist really well. Unless there's something a bit more special like one of the Huskarls, Imperial Fists tend to be a bit bog standard and not carry around much other than their bolters, so that's what I'm going to lean on here. Achieving a good yellow has plagued painters for years. However, with modern paints, it's a lot more accessible and quite easy to do. Now, what I've done here is prime the model white, then from underneath spray it a strong red colour, then from the top heavily zenithal the yellow until I get a nice strong colour. But now the magic touch is to get a lot more luster into that color. So I'm going to grab a yellow shade color, liberally apply that all over. This will create a lot more oomph in the yellow as well as shading all the crevices. Once that's done, I'll turn to my trusty black legion once again. I swear this is my favorite paint ever. I'm just going to do all the metals, but not on the armor trim. I'm going to keep that black, just highlighting it with a little bit of gray. Painting an interesting plume is pretty easy. I'll base coat the entirety of it in an off-white, apply a bit of shade, and then when that's dry, I'll go in and block out segments using a darker contrast paint. I'll paint in the eyes, and you may have already noticed that I've blocked in the base a darker colour using contrast. This is just to get rid of as much yellow as possible. I did this using a very dark brown contrast and then I'll just overbrush using a grey. This will create a really nice dirty stone, perfect for battlefield debris. And there we have it, another legion done. Next up we have the ninth legion, the Blood Angels. Blood Angels came from some truly horrific origins. Simply put, they are cannibals. They will eat the brains of their foes and even their fellow brothers to gain insight and their memories. It was only through the intervention of their Primark Sanguinius that they were able to rise to glory. Blood angels were often depicted with classical iconography such as angels and gold filigree on their armor. So yeah, blood angels are basically vampires and they're also Jazz's favorite army. So this isn't my first time painting up a blood angel. We'd actually done one a couple of videos ago, so I already had a little bit of experience on how I wanted to tackle this project. When it comes to the Mark III armor for blood angels, I feel like the armor itself is a little bit lackluster when the blood angels have a lot of filigree and design in their actual paint scheme. This means you're gonna have to either try your best at freehanding a lot of that filigree or try and see if you can kit bash it on. And for my Blood Angel, unfortunately I didn't have a ton to work with, but I did however have this really cool shoulder pad. When making my Blood Angel, I definitely wanted to make him in a really cool pose, like he's shooting and just casually walking through a giant battlefield. I did however have to cannibalize his hand a little bit. It is one of the downsides of this particular Horus Heresy kit. The arms in this particular kit do require a bit of kit bash 
clashing if you want something other than your space marine to be holding a gun. In this circumstance, I did have to butcher a couple of hands and a couple of swords in order to fit the right look. I even put the chainsaw on the wrong way at one point, but I was able to easily fix this. I also added on a couple of purity seals just to make him super loyalist and super blood angel-y. So to make it easier on myself, I sprayed up my Blood Angel in just a base layer of red. Games Workshop has my back and has a contrast paint specifically for Blood Angels. So I slopped this all over my model and waited for it to dry. Once I was happy with how he was looking, I went ahead and dry brushed on just a brighter red to really bring him together. Now this Blood Angel doesn't have a whole lot on him, so I really wanted his face and his shoulder pad to stand out. So I went ahead and painted this in more of a royal gold, washing it down with Agrax Earthshade and then line highlighting it on top again to really make it pop. Again, I would have loved to have added that classic style that Blood Angels in the Horus Heresy had, but I wasn't going to risk trying to freehand on this tiny model and I'm just not confident it was going to turn out good. So he's just not as fancy as the other Blood Angels and that's totally okay. When it came to basing, I wanted to try and contrast a more softer feel with the bright red, so I opted for a desert scene. Backing on a couple of those tufts and a laser cut plant on top. I also added some weathering pigments on top just to blend him into the base nicely. And with that, my Blood Angel is all done. Now, do you know what the next chapter is? I know Dave's doing it. So the next legion up is the 10th legion, the Iron Hands. Grim, tenacious, and resourceful, the Iron Hands have a strong connection to the Mechanicus, to Artifice, and to Machines. And their legion makeup was forever changed when their father, the Primarch Ferris Manus, was killed at Istvan in the Drop Site Massacre. I must confess, I've never really given the Iron Hands much of a second thought, so it'll be interesting to build and paint one today. Now the Iron Hands are another legion where Mark III Iron Armor is a super good fit. The Iron Hands have this really industrial feel and close ties to the Mechanicum, and these heavy, thick bonded plate armor pieces seem to suit that very nicely. They also fought in big ranks with heavy sieged weaponry as a little bit of a mirror to the Iron Warriors, and they're known for their resilience. All of these are characterized fantastically by Mark III. Originally, I wanted to make a Breacher, but one of my complaints with this kit is the number of arms that you have and their speed specific sculpting makes it almost impossible to have them as anything but two-handed weapon holders. There's one arm for a sergeant on the left arm that you can use to hold a pistol and it is only in one quite limited pose. So I tried to make an Iron Hands suitable breacher shield out of the lid from a chest from Necromunda. It would have been the perfect size, but unfortunately I couldn't find an arm that would fit it and make it look right. So instead I returned to a tactical marine and decided to give him the Vox as well as a bare head with cybernetic enhancements to feel like an Iron Hand. So in playing with the Neo Echo airbrush a little bit more, I found that it was pretty good for base coating. The dual action trigger gave me a fair bit of control and the cheap portable compressor was fine. The extra parts in the kit are fantastic to have in a cheap airbrush and very rare. Often expensive airbrushes don't even have spare needles or nozzles, certainly not of different sizes. However, that's not particularly functional when you immediately place in the 0.2 mil and it clogs, doesn't work and bubbles out the top. I don't know if this is tooling issues because they're cheaper airbrushes or I just got a bad one, but either way, it highlights the limitations of cheaper equipment. However, if you are a beginner, this certainly is a great way to get started and has much more control than a terrible Amazon single action. With my previous paint job on my Dark Angel, I did mention how many of the loyalists are just black with silver trim. So I'd like to make them look a little bit different. There's a lot of metallic undertones in their black armor. So I decided to spray the whole model silver and then dry brush it with a brighter silver. I then went all over the model in a nice wash using gloss null oil and then a little bit of Agrax Earthshade in carefully placed areas on the trim. Then I carefully use the contrast paint Black Legion to cover all of the armor panels. This is a much, much quicker way rather than picking out the trim. And I think if you're going to use this, it's a super easy way to do iron hands. However, it doesn't quite get the effect that I'm looking for. So once that is dry, I got a super dry brush, got some metallic, rubbed most of it off, and then stippled a rough amount of metal all over the black armor, just really delicately and softly with a dry brush. This gives a metallic sheen to the highlight areas and makes it look like it's a very dark or worn metal. The iron hands are often seen with rust or patina all over their armor. So to do that, I used weathering pigments in some select areas to create a lot of variance over the model. For some of the more mechanical parts, I painted a very worn decayed metal from scale 75 with a highlight and an Agrax Earthshade wash. For the face, I made a nice grizzled veteran with some layering up of Caucasian skin tones. Then one thing I hadn't done before that I thought would be fun is I gave this guy a nice receding hairline and bald patch as if his high testosterone life of being a space marine has wreaked havoc on his hair. The lenses on iron 
second hands are picked out in blue and they do usually have a couple of transfers. The Skatari transfer sheet is fantastic for the little warning symbol I put on his knee, but I don't have any specific iron hands transfers, so I may do for today. Grabbing a cog from one of my Skatari transfer sheets and an Imperial Fists fist, which I then painted over slightly to turn it into an iron hand. You could say I unclenched the Imperial Fist to create the Iron Hand. With these done, a nice desolate dark base with a few bits of plant life is the perfect match for our grim demeanored Iron Hands. This is a super, super easy paint job and I think really stands out due to the weathering despite being quite simple in colors. For my final legion, I will be doing the 13th, the Ultramarines, and I actually collect these myself for Horus Heresy. So I'm gonna have a bit of fun with this one. Now, Ultramarines are known in 40K for being the poster childs and the most flexible. They do everything. They have this book that they like to read. However, in the Heresy, they are more philosophers. They like to think about things. They haven't compounded everything into a leatherback yet, and they're still being very philosophical. However, that doesn't stop them entering the fight, seeing what works, and then deciding, I'm gonna take that and make it better. So the inspiration for this Marine is going to be the Nemesis Destroyers, a special unit of destroyers in the 22nd chapter. Now, traditionally, destroyers run around dual wielding bolt pistols with special chemo rounds to inflict utter devastation and horror upon their enemies. They are never deployed lightly, suffer a huge amount of stigma from the rest of their Legion brothers, and are basically walking radioactive nightmares. As I said, the Ultramarines have a very special unit in the 22nd chapter, which uses predominantly bolters and special chemotoxin rounds that they may or may not have taken from the Death Guard at some point. With this vision in mind, Mark III was a perfect fit, as the helmets also almost perfectly match the design of the Destroyer helm. To drive home the fact that he's extra scary, I'm gonna stick a bayonet onto his bolter, just for emphasis. Extra details to denote the war gear will be lots of grenades and belts. However, to lean on using just what's in this kit, I had a sudden idea. There's a lightning claw here on each of the sergeant sprues, so you're probably gonna have a fair few left over. So I grabbed the power housing for that, cut all of the blades themselves off, and I have this really weird esoteric device. So I'm gonna use this as a visual motif to suggest that it's one of the more radioactive power plants on the destroyer. And the sculpt recess underneath the power plant is gonna fit perfectly onto one of the shoulder pads. So I'm gonna stick it right there. No one is gonna be questioning which legion or chapter this particular Marine is from anyway. For a final touch, I want to have him stalking through smoking ruins looking for prey, possibly word bearers on the planet Kalf as it burns all around them. So with that rubble down, it's time to start painting. For my Ultramarine, I'm gonna paint him entirely blue all over, nothing fancy here. Then I'll make a mix of blue and black contrast paints, dilute it down liberally and put that over the entire model. Then I'll start blocking in everything, and you guessed it, with Black Legion. Then once I've finished all the normal areas, I'll keep going with the black, marking in all the areas that denote him as a destroyer. However, I'll probably retain a lot more blue just to mark him out as an Ultramarine. I'm gonna do the face, the chest, and a few lines across different parts of the armor. Then it's onto the metals, overbrushing the silver and then making a very cold gold. This is a trick I picked up recently by mixing gold with a dark blue color. I'll then highlight that with a normal gold highlight, highlight the blues and the blacks. For extra detail, I'll paint some of the visible rounds in the bolter with a green contrast to mark them out as scary ammunition. Then finally, I'll sketch in the ultramarine symbol on one shoulder and give the base a gray dry brush, creating that rubble effect I'm looking for. And there we have it, my ultramarine destroyer is finished. My final marine today will be from the 18th Legion. That's the Salamanders. Coming from a volcanic world, the Salamanders have a close affinity with high quality artifice and also fire burning things, lots of fiery, burny things. Their armor's this really cool green and they have lots of flame patterns on them, which will be really fun to paint and make. But they, much like many of the Loyalist Legions, are characterized by the amount of suffering they went through at the Dropsite Massacre. Salamanders also have a reputation for being basically some of the friendliest, nicest dudes out of all the Space Marines, and I've always thought that's cool. They go out of their way to protect civilians and avoid casualties of innocence, and they're pretty upright, good people, which is very rare for Space Marines. I I definitely feel like I lucked out today, getting three legions for which iron armor seems perfect. The Salamander's heavy armored appearance covered in leathers, scales, and also their fondness for flame and melter weapons makes iron armor once again quite an iconic choice for them. When it comes to Salamander's, the main thing I wanted to do is make sure he had a flamethrower, because that would be, well, 
just perfectly iconic. But I couldn't make any normal flamethrower, so I decided to make one of their awesome dragon's breath flamers. To make this unique, I cut the tip off the Thousand Suns flamer I'd previously butchered for my Dark Angel conversion, and I shortened the end of it. Then a kind Ripper Swarm donated two of its claws so I could create little dragon's fangs. This turns the beaked end of the Thousand Suns 40k flamer into a really nice snarling dragon. I then cut off the tip of a heresy flamer, and now we're left with an awesome, highly artificed salamander's dragon's breath flamer. So to paint my silly salamander, I grabbed some heavy green from Viejo and then painted all of the green armor panels. I gave the model a dry brush with mutation green from Viejo on all of those raised areas to create some nice differentiation. Picking out the trim with scale 75's Victorian brass, I then highlighted it all in Moonstone Alchemy. Their brass color is depicted as quite bright gold or brass in many artworks, but I think this middle ground works well for the salamanders. With a Reichland flesh shade wash all over that, the metals are done already. You can go back over and pick out a few more highlight areas with that Moonstone Alchemy to really make it pop. Select mechanical areas on the model were painted in a silver and given a Null Oil wash, and altogether it was looking pretty basic, but pretty complete. And that's because what really makes salamanders pop are the wild flame patterns. Now there's a cheat I like to use with free hands. You can actually turn them into little stencils, making it a lot easier to paint some cool stuff. There's an artwork in the rule book of a salamander's icon that looks like it's on fire. So I decided to do that. Painting a 40K salamander's transfer yellow, and then bringing in various oranges and reds to emulate scales of this fire drake. I then underpinned both that emblem and the shoulder pad on the other side, as well as one knee with a freehand fire pattern. Just bringing flames up with darker reds and then going down towards the bottom with brighter oranges to yellow. This is quite an impactful part of the paint scheme, but I do think it's a vital one. Without it, the salamanders can kind of look boring, especially when doing an army painting technique like this. And it really doesn't take that long, maybe 20 minutes per model. As a finishing touch, I freehanded on a unit marking for his role as a fire support squad member, and then based him with some crackled earth and burnt bushes. That concludes the salamanders and my portion of today's video. I hope my tips for quickly painting loyalist armies for Horus Heresy help you all in the future. So for my last army, we have the 19th Legion, the Raven Guard. Starting out as prisoners who were uplifted by their Primarch Korax, the Raven Guard are a cunning legion known for their skills as stealth operatives. Favoring the use of jetpacks and snipers and anything sneaky, sabotage and assassination were a part of their battlefield tactics. Raven Guard was one of the most devastated factions on Eastvan, with majority of the legion being wiped out except for a few survivors. So the last of the models and for this series is the Raven Guard. And I wanted to try and do something that we actually hadn't tackled yet, but I thought would be really fitting for the Raven Guard. That was to absolutely obliterate this poor mini. I got in with my hobby knife and tore this thing to pieces. Obviously I wanted to try and keep it all in one piece, but I definitely wanted him to look like he had been through absolute hell and back. And I cannot lie, it was kind of fun carving this thing up and drilling holes into it. When it comes to the Mark III armor for Raven Guard, I don't particularly mind it, but it does seem a little odd because I feel like the Raven Guard should have the baubles on the shoulder and on the legs. But again, this did make it way easier for me to absolutely destroy it. This time around, I decided to keep my Raven Guard just as a generic Marine so I could really get into the weathering. Lastly, I did want to spend a little bit more time on this model, so I tried my best to freehand the emblem on his shoulder pad. I don't think I did an amazing job, but I think it kind of serves a purpose. And at the end of the day, it was going to get messed up anyway. I went ahead and sponged on just a little bit of black paint to look like the emblem was chipping off. And with the Raven Guard finished, that is the last of our loyalist. And let's take a look at them all, shall we? It's time for the final reveals.
We love our patrons and it's thanks to you that we can make this content two times a week. There were many shouting for the loyalist half, so we decided to do that as a quick turnaround video for all of you because we do listen and read your comments. And I'd also like to take the opportunity today to thank some of our newest Patreon members, Distinct Dev, Fred Lobster, Gwenks, and Dan Zenner. Welcome to the Patreon, chuck in the Discord, say hi, and hopefully we'll see you in the mini review. Well, that was a surprising journey and I actually found myself enjoying some of these paint schemes a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, for me in particular, the iron hands I went into with zero interest, but with the way the model turned out so easily, I thought it was pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you really turned around on that one. <laughs> I also loved the Dark Angels. It was so fun doing all these checkered patterns and it's really tempting to do a full army of them. I was really happy with my Space Wolf. I think he turned out the best. Yeah, one thing I'd really like to see in more of these kits is bolt pistols, more variation in heads. Like the design is okay, but give us more options, even just more variety. That would be amazing. Thank you. Can't wait to do it with another set of armor. Yeah, I think that accessory sprue is really good, but it would have been even better if they dropped one or two random things like the gas mask for like one more set of hands for your sergeants or something like that. Totally. Uh, makes it really hard to do conversions, to be honest. Oh, and as a final thing, now that the studio has uh, all 17 active legions, I decided to bring back my alpha legion. I was gonna use him in my army, but I've decided it's it's best to have all the legions. So he's returning home. They're all, all on display in a happy family here once again. Now subscribe. All the alpha legion gets it. Nice. You can press stop anytime you want.